morning. So I'm going to preface this by saying this is already old. <laughs> I was changing things this morning and they're already changing, so we're definitely in the part of the session where things start happening quickly. Um, so this is what we knew as of last night and a few minutes ago. So this is a legislative update on what's happening at the Capitol during the 88th legislative session. So our object objectives this morning are to discuss um, what's going on downtown, highlight some of the potential impacts to property owners. There's a lot of focus on property tax relief, um, rightfully so, and then highlight the potential impacts to the district budget. Right now, it's really just a shot at the dartboard with a blindfold on because one of the bills has 400 amendments, and so trying to figure out which one of those will gain traction and happen. Um, so budgeting in a legislative session is always challenging, especially with a June 30 fiscal year in, because you don't really know what your funding is until your budget has already been prepared. And so I've warned the board this year we're going to be amending because there's a lot of changes potentially coming. So also want to um, acknowledge where I stole this information from. So fortunately, the Region 13 Service Center put on a webinar last Thursday with Mo Casey and the Texas School Coalition presenting. And so I was fortunate to receive this information over the weekend and be able to copy and paste and not have to create all this information <coughs> from scratch because it probably would have taken many more days. So this is where, um, this, this is what the session looks like. It started back in January, on January 10th. That feels like a year ago. Um, March 10th was the last day to file a bill. So all the bills have been filed, but now it's amendments. And so now we amend bills that have been filed. The session ends May 29th. So I mentioned earlier we're a June 30 fiscal year end. So I can't wait till June 30 to finish the budget. So when the session ends at the end of May, um, and then you have to publish your notice by 10 days before the hearing, there's just no physical time to incorporate those changes. And then June 18th is the last day the governor has to sign the bill, so he could wait until mid-June before we even know if the law is going to become law or he vetoes that. Um, this session has had more bills than we've seen in the last three, so we're over 8,000 bills. You can see the House has filed many more bills than the Senate, House being in green. Um, back in the 87th session, the last session, we were about 7,500 or 7,000. So much more activity going on this time. Um, 1,300 of those bills impact public education. So it's not all about school finance, but that's what we're focusing on today. Um, this is from Frisco ISD's dashboard. So they have a dashboard tracking all of the bills. And so this is the 1300, how they're broken out. And you'll notice on property tax, it by far is, have, has more attention than anything else. Um, second to that is school finance and then school safety. And then it's interesting to me that we had a committee to look at teacher retention, but then you'll notice bills addressing teacher pay are very few. So, supplemental appropriations, what is this? So the current biennium that ends in August 23 looks at how much is the state going to have left from the current budget. And there's $8.2 billion left from the foundation school program, money that was allocated to fund schools. There's money left because of ESSER, the federal fund supplanting, higher than expected property value growth, and recapture. So of that 8.2 billion, the state is an appropriations bill saying, what would we do with those surplus funds? So this 8.2 is from school budgets that the state allocated, which is part of that larger nearly $33 billion surplus the state has. So related to education, they're looking at that $8 billion surplus, and the House and the Senate are very different. So on the House side, 
You're looking at putting $3.5 billion towards TRS benefit enhancements. That could look like a 13th check for retirees. I saw something this morning about a 7,500 lump sum payment to retirees that are over 75. Um, I don't know if it's part of this appropriation or a new funding bill, but you'll notice the, state, the Senate has only got one billion going towards TRS benefits. And then on school safety, they're about a billion apart. The House is 1.6 billion for school safety and the Senate 0.6 billion. Well, what you'll notice on the House side, there's three billion. I don't know what they're doing with that. And then on the Senate side, there's 6.6 .6 billion that, you don't know where that's going. And of that $8.2 billion surplus, 2.4 billion of that is from recapture. So when you see anything that says supplemental appropriation, that means talking about the current biennium's budget and what to do with that surplus. And looking, for, looking at the state budget for the upcoming biennium, Right now, as you saw in the number of bills that have been filed, 15 to 17 billion of that is allocated towards property tax cuts, and we've got 5 billion for funding for public schools. So looking at the differences here on the state budget, so first of all, House Bill 3 requires school districts to compress their M&O tax rate. So if I lower my tax rate, that potentially brings me less revenue. So the state has to make that up. So under current law, they need 5.3 billion to fund those compressed tax rates. 2.4 billion is going to an increase in the golden penny yield. So remember, we have three categories in our m and tax rate. We've got the maximum compressed rate, the MCR, our golden pennies and our copper pennies. Current statute requires golden penny yield to be adjusted if there's an increase in the basic allotment and to keep pace with the 96th percentile of wealth per water. So these dollars are just to maintain what they've already passed unless they change that law. Then again, on the House side, there's 12 billion for additional property tax relief 9.8 billion on the Senate side, and we're going to look at each of these bills a little bit closer. So, the appropriations bill: 2.5 billion for enrollment growth. Again, 2.4 billion for golden penny yield. So, right now, a golden penny is guaranteed to bring the district $98.56 per watt per weighted ADA. For next year, it's going. To, it's proposed to go to a 126.21, and then the following year up to 129.52. And we're going to look at what that brings the district. And then the five billion for other school funding increases on the house that is broken out between teacher compensation, changes to the teacher incentive allotment, um, a very minimal change to the basic allotment money for school safety, the instructional materials and technology allotment, and special education. On the Senate side, you'll see they too have special ed, instructional materials, school safety. What's missing here? There's nothing here about the basic allotment. Educational savings accounts on the Senate side, silent as to teacher incentive allotment. And then the basic allotment, we've talked about this a lot in our previous Taxpayer Tuesdays. Right now it's 6160 That was set in 2019. Every $100 increase costs the state $1.4 billion. So you might keep that number in mind. So when we look at the golden penny yield for Dripping Springs, and this is a back of the napkin, quick and dirty estimation once you go through all the funding template, it will all change, and this is just a piece, so this doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to get all of these revenues, but if you just look at the pure formula, I'm using the same WADA, the same weighted average daily attendance that we have this year in the next two years just to see what that gain would be. Because if I increase this for what we project future WADA, then it, it's a little distorting, right? So today that yield is 98.56. 
if it goes up to $126.21 on the eight pennies that we have, our level one entitlement on golden pennies would be $9.6 million versus the $7.5 million that we did today. So that's a $2 million increase. That's great, but remember we're losing other entitlements, so that doesn't mean that we're keeping the $2 million. There's something else I was going to say here. Um, and then the following year, that small increase is just a little bit more. I saw one run that showed part of this would be funded by the state. So last year, the state funded part of our golden penny yield. This year, we don't get any state aid. We potentially are getting state aid to make this 9.6. Then I, what I was going to say is, remember, these dollars are not subject to recapture. So any increase in the golden penny yield is a win for us as far as recapture goes. So switching gears and looking at what is being proposed on property tax relief. So again, very different approaches. So on the house side, House Bill 2 is looking at 15 cents of additional compression. So our m and rate today with the MCR, the golden, and the copper pennies all combined is 94 cents. So this bill would compress that another 15 cents. So that would go down by 15 cents. It is also introducing a 5% appraisal cap on all real property. So today, under current law, this applies only to homesteads, and it's a 10% cap. So your appraised value can go up to whatever the market says, but under this bill, your taxable value could only increase by 5% instead of 10. The big kicker here is it's now all real property. So under current law, it's just homestead. So the majority of our values are real property. So this would be a big change for Dripping Springs. The cost of this bill plus current law, remember I showed you just to meet the current law, was five something. So now the cost of this is $17 billion. And it reduces recapture statewide by about $4.5 billion. The Senate side is very different. It is looking at increasing the homestead exemption to 70,000. So remember, we just voted for and approved an increase to 40,000. And then it adds an additional 30,000 for our 65 plus population. So they would be looking at a homestead exemption of 100,000. Um, additional tier one rate compression, but not a lot of detail on what that compression looks like. And then business personal property tax. So if you have business personal property less than 25,000, then there's no rendition for that, so no tax. And then the cost of all of these is 16.5 billion, so a little bit less than the house side, but it only reduces recapture by at least one billion. So there's a big difference in the recapture treatment between the house and the Senate. So House Bill 2, Again, 15 cents of tier one rate compression. It makes no change to the 90% compression floor. What the heck does that mean? So I'm gonna to try to break this down. It gets really confusing. So remember there's a ceiling and a floor on the LCR. The ceiling is where compression is going to go at least. And then the floor is the max. This floor cannot be 90%, cannot be more than 90% than this ceiling up here. So it's not changing that, but you're gonna see on the Senate side, they're changing that to 80% between that floor and ceiling. And then again, reduces the appraisal growth from 10 to 5% on all real property. So that's the House bill, and it has been in the first committee. The Senate side, Again, the 70,000 increase. I don't know what this is talking about exactly, but includes a catch-up provision for 65 plus and disabled. So I haven't seen details on what this catch-up provision is. But here's the real kicker on this. Usually when a bill is passed on homestead exemptions, they do not hold school districts harmless on the debt side if you have future debt. And so on INS, the whole harmless would only apply to bonds as of September 1, 2022. 
So that means our tax collections on the INS side would have a $30,000 hit per property and the state would not make that up. On the M&O side, and this is really confusing, it says would be calculated post 88th legislation covering the 40 to the 70. Well, we just had a provision from 25 to 40, so now that's another law school districts have to calculate to figure out that hold harmless, and then you've got this new hold harmless. So when you start talking about homestead exemption changes, now school districts would be trying to apply three different laws to figure out their revenue. So it's like the Internal Revenue Service Code, you just keep band-aiding and band-aiding and it becomes quite a nightmare to keep up with. Then Senate Bill 4, this is where that current 90% in the ceiling of the floor would be lowered to 80%, so that would make a big change in differences between tax rates across the state. And it spends $5.4 billion to lower tax rates, which is about 7 pennies versus the 15 pennies on the House side. And then here is that um, increase in personal property exemption. So that's currently $2,500. It would be raised to $25,000. And that's under Senate Bill 5. And that would cost the state up to $180 it also is first committee i think all of these senate all of these senate bills have been through first committee so i put together a spreadsheet and hopefully this will work to see what does this really look like for for a property owner so you walk me through this so under current law you have a house with an appraised value of $556,000. You have a homestead of $40,000, so your taxable value is $516,000. Our MO tax rate is $9429. So the maintenance and operations taxes this household is paying is $4,800. Our INS tax rate is $0.35. Cents. So the debt service taxes at $1,800 for a total school bill of $6,672. Okay, that's this year. Under current law, value can go up 10%. So I've just grown the appraised value. So this is a little bit more aggressive. So if the appraised value grows by 10%, you can see the new value, same homestead exemption, if our tax rate stays at 94.29 and 35 cents, now your school tax bill is 7,391 for an increase of $700. All right, so the proposed legislation, looking at those one at a time, an increase in the homestead exemption, again, assuming 10% property value growth, if the homestead, whoa, what happened to my sheet? <laughs> So it still went up. Your taxable value still went up because of value increase. We keep the tax rate the same. Just could have an apples to apples comparison. Now your school tax bill is just over seven thousand dollars for an increase of three hundred. So that's better than current law. But is it the best? So if we look over here at a fifteen cent reduction in the school rate, again ten percent value growth. So. This appraised value is still the same. The homestead exemption stays at 40, so your taxable value is higher. But now, look, my M&O rate has gone down by 15 cents. So now it's 79 cents. We kept the INS rate the same at 35 cents. Now your school tax bill is 6,500 
or a decrease of 439 over current year. So that's better than the 70,000 homestead exemption, right? And it doesn't mess up my IMS tax collections. 5% value growth, so now we're only growing appraised value by 5%. Keeping the 40,000 homestead exemption, now your taxable value is 543. Keep the school district tax rate the same, because all we're changing is the 5% cap. Now your taxes are 7,032, still an increase of 359 over the current year. And then if we do all of those things, so the whole enchilada. 15 cent reduction in the school tax rate, a 5% cap, and a homestead increase of 70,000. Now, all of those things, your taxes are 5,873 for a decrease of almost $800 over current year. So for you, all of it together is the best thing. The state can't afford that, so it's gonna be some combination. But what was interesting to me is if we can't do everything, instead of messing with homestead exemptions, compress the school district tax rates and give us hold harmless, it makes my life easier. It's better for y'all. And so when you hear about all of these bills floating around, here's the true impact. Any questions about that? Do you have any prediction, gut instinct of what <laughs> might kind of hone in on? <laughs> I don't. It's so all over the place. And is there any pressure from the dis all districts to yeah, everybody I from mean, one or the other? We've been asking for basic allotment increase. Um, we know compression is going to continue to happen. They just need to change the ceiling and the floor. Um, but if we don't get basic allotment increase, and you're going to see some of these bills that are filed, they're really giving us a lot more cost and no additional money. Do any of these? Reduce our <coughs> An increase in the basic allotment would and a compression of the tax rate would. The hold harmless does in a roundabout way because our tax collections would be less. <coughs> so remember, we either have to increase our number of kids and have a bigger tier one entitlement to get out to reduce recapture, or we have to lower our tax collections. Do any of these impact recapture? So they do indirectly, but there's not there's very few bills filed intentionally to address recapture. So let me figure out where we were. Uh, one more question. Do any of these represent less income to the district? Yes. And how much? That we don't know yet. So that's the fun thing of trying to put a budget together. Um, because there's 400 amendments, so everything that I calculate today would be. Can we expand that to the flip? Are there any of these options that potentially would not impact revenue for the district? So theoretically, a compression of the tax rate the state makes up. But I'm going to show you that short-lived. Um, the homestead exemption, we're going to be penalized on the INS side. And then what they say they were, when it went from 15,000 to 25,000, that was hold harmless. Now that's going away. When it went from 25,000 to 40,000, 40, that was hold harmless. Now it's potentially going away. So now they're saying from 40 to 70, there's going to be hold harmless. What happens in three years when they don't have money? It's going to go away. And so I always look at these bills not about what's going to happen next year, what's going to happen in five years. If that bill goes through on a whole harmless, is there always an end date associated? Not always. Um, they use this thing called proration because they say, oh, we intended to give you that money, just like fast growth, formula transition. But then they get to budget and they don't have the money. So we said, well, we're going to give you a portion of what we said. Okay, so specific education related bills. So remember, this is inflation since 2019, back when House Bill 3 was passed, 
and the basic allotment was set at 61.60, and then inflation. So we've seen a 14.5% increase in inflation in Texas since 2019. So the school finance bills, House Bill 100. When I put this in here, not set for hearing, I think they're gonna start discussing it this week. So it increased right now, initial runs show it increases the state costs just between one and 1.5 billion. This is where I get really frustrated. $50 increase in the basic allotment. That does nothing. And whatever you gain from that $50, half of it has to go to compensation for teachers, librarians, and counselors. Today, the law is 30%. They're raising that to 50%, which it doesn't matter. We're already using it, all of the gain for that anyway. It would extend formula transition grant to year 29-30, which is set to expire next 24-25, uh, and it removes the cap on uh, fast growth allotment. So right now, they rank all the state, all the districts across the state as far as growth, and then fund a percentage of them, but they only allocated a certain dollar amount. So if there's more fast growth districts than they have money for, that proration comes into effect. So House Bill 100 would remove that cap and fully fund fast growth. So that's a good thing. There's a revised committee substitute that includes a slightly larger basic allotment. I haven't seen anything about what that is. So is it 55? Is it 70? I don't know what a slightly larger basic allotment increase is. So in regards to teacher compensation, these are significantly different. House Bill 100 has an increase to the minimum salary schedule with salary transition grants. So what is the minimum salary schedule? The state publishes a schedule that says this is the minimum you will pay teachers. I haven't looked it up lately, but it is so antiquated. It's like 55. It's yeah, it is so low. 35 is the bottom. Yeah, like 35,000. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know a district that pays 35,000 for a first year teacher. You wouldn't get one. So they would increase that minimum salary schedule. Um, it would have the $50 increase to the basic allotment. Again, 50% of the gain goes towards salaries. Formula transition dis grant districts, in fact, do not receive new funding, and we're going to look at why. So we're a formula transition grant district. I have a question, Lee. Uh, if you'll go back. So if I'm understanding, like currently the law is that 30% of your budget needs to go to pay staff. It's 30% of the gain from an increase in the basic allotment. And then um, they want to increase it to 50%, but would you say that most districts pay over that already? Well, so the this percentage that has to go to raises has nothing to do with this salary schedule. So okay. this is just a clean up. What this impacts is statutory minimum for TRS. So if, if the minimum salary is 35,000 for a first year teacher and we're paying 50,000, we have to pay the additional TRS on that and so that's called a staff min calculation. Mm -hmm. So raising that salary schedule would potentially change what we're having to pay as a district for that statutory minimum because the minimum would be increased. This gain is not related to this, so they haven't raised the basic allotment since 2019. So if it went from 6160 to 6500, those additional revenues from that change, 50% of those revenues have to go to the salary increase. When we were talking, when we were at Rally Day, we were talking to a state rep, and they they did not want to raise the basic allotment because they seemed to believe that the district would not pay teachers from that <laughs> and so um we have to by right. law <laughs> so they're like well we only have to give 30 percent you're already like pay the teachers the money and so, i'm just trying to understand that is that even possible most people are already paying them over we're paying like, them, over what the yes. requirement is and you're going to see by the state. what we have budgeted 
our forecast for salary increases greatly exceeds what a $50 increase gives us. So I want to, before we talk about the Senate side, I want to look at this formula transition grant issue. So when House Bill 3 was passed, it said all districts are going to see at least a 3% gain from House Bill 3 compared to old law. And if not, formula transition grant money may transition you into the formula so you're not hurt. So Dripping Springs was one of those that would not have seen a 3% increase. So we get formula transition grant money. There's about 228 schools and charter schools that rely on this, but they only allocated 400 million. So this year, we lost a million from this proration. It expires in 23-24, so in the fall of 24, the 24-25 school year, that money goes away. These salary increases that are required don't expire. So our formula transition money expires, but we're still held to the expenditure clauses. So we're going to be required to fund these without the compensation or the money to do that. So that's the importance of formula transition. So on the Senate side, and this is really crazy, this is a one time, one year, they're going to give us money. If, you're, if you have 20,000 students or more, teachers, nurses, counselors, and librarians are going to get a $2,000 one-time payment. If you're less than 20,000, then it's $6,000. I don't know where the magic 20,000 came from, but I was talking to my friend at Pflugerville yesterday, and she's like, all my teachers are going to want to go to work for you because they get $6,000. <laughs> And what makes the teacher any better, depending on the size of the district? So it's totally inequitable, and it's a one-time thing. So what I know is when you give them people money and then you take it away, they're not happy. So I have lots of commentary about this one. Okay, so that increase in a basic allotment. So today it's at 61.60. So Based on our ADA, and again, this is just a really easy calculation, it's much harder than this, our tier one entitlement would be just under 50 million. Next year, our ADA is, ex or, oh, I have changed these numbers 15,000 times and they won't stick. This is 23-24. Our ADA is 83-ADA, and this goes to 6,210. $52 million, so a $2.2 million gain, but hold up, it's not really a gain. So in theory, and you don't do the gain, this isn't the gain, you calculate this based on last year's ADA and a lot more calculations, but then the following year, 3.7, but a 1% salary increase district-wide for us for next year is about $600,000. For next year's budget, we have 4.6 million in salary increases and new positions because we're growing, right? So growth means more teachers. So if I gain $2 million from the $50 increase in the basic allotment, but I'm spending almost $5 million on salaries alone, that doesn't account for any other cost. $50 in the basic allotment is a really slap in the face. It's just, here, we'll give you a bow and go away. Okay, out of school finance, school safety. So this gets even more fun. So remember the Supplemental Appropriations Act, $60 million on the Senate side and $1.6 billion on the House side for the current school year. Well, the current school year is already over, so I'm not sure how they're going to distribute this money. But when you look at safety, so right now we get $9.72 per ADA. They're going to increase it to a whopping $10 for school safety, and then $15,000 per campus. But then the requirement is that we have an armed security officer on each campus. Serena, how many armed security officers do you know that will work for $15,000 a year? <laughs> How many can you hire tomorrow? 
at every campus across the state. And where I am, police shortage. Exactly. So I don't know where we're going to find all these people. And I don't know how we're going to fund them because they're giving us 15000 And then they're going to restrict who we buy technology and which vendors we use. So that sounds like a lobbyist to me. And then TEA is going to monitor if we don't comply with all these things. They're going to sanction us. And if we have bond proceeds, we have to spend them on safety first. So this one I'm really wondering about because we do have safety in our May bond proposal, but if I have to do all of this first, does that mean I can't start designing new schools? I can't break ground on Sycamore's expansion? And you know how long it's gonna to take to get all of those safety things done to our campuses? So it really hampers us in being able to accommodate growth by making us spend our bond money there first. Who decides what the, the safety needs are? The state. The state decides that, and then all of those have to be accomplished first. I was going to say, I wonder if it means allocated, if right. it means construction start, if it means board approval to start that process. I get not defined. And then House Bill 13, 1.7 billion, gives us $100 per ADA and requires mental health training and some other things. So at least $100 is a little bit more, but $10 per ADA is a joke. And I saw a slide, Santa Fe ISD that had a safety incident, and from their safety allotment this past year, they received about $35,000. Uvalde received about $35,000. So 972 is not sufficient. On the Senate bill side, Again, $10 per ADA, $15 per campus. Again, restrictions on who we purchase from. And then Creighton has $0, but requires all school districts and charters to have panic alert devices. So I guess that $50 increase in the basic allotment is supposed to fund that. Instructional materials funding, this current biennium, they cut it by 60% at the last minute. So this is the money they give us to buy textbooks and technology. There's money, an introduced bill to restore it, but not to where it was before. And so this doesn't account for any growth, and it's still less than it was before the cuts last session. And then recapture, so this one's interesting. Um, Creighton has introduced a 10% discount on recapture if we pay it all by February 15th. So prior to House Bill 3, starting in February, you made monthly payments from February to August of your recapture. House Bill 3 changed it that you can make all of your recapture payment in August, and that way you could keep that money and earn interest on it. Now, if we give it to the state to earn interest on rather than us, they'll give us a 10% discount. Um, and we really don't know what our full recapture is until months after fiscal year end because we haven't finalized anything. So I don't know what that 10% is based on. Is it my estimate? Is it the state's estimate? Um, and then there's House Bill 2355 that re would require information on tax bills, on how much of the property tax benefit locals or the local tax payment benefits the school district and what percent is going to the state for recapture. So I'd actually support that. Can I ask a question about the 10%? Mm -hmm. Just hypothetical. If we have a numbers by then, which we don't because of estimate versus um, final tax bill and everything, but the 10%, like this year, that would get a 2.4 million, that would be much higher than any potential interest that we get. It is. Yeah. It is. It just starts me that it's, well, it's on it's arbitrary. Yeah. We don't have that number yet because it's the we're not serving. But it's yet. it's costing yeah. me lost revenues because I could invest that money, I could invest that two point four million and make additional money. Mm -hmm. But now I'm gonna to get to chase that ten percent, I'm gonna give up those okay. revenues. Yeah. So it irks me. Yeah. Um, this is what recapture has looked like since the beginning of time, and you can see Five billion, or estimated 23, 24, 
And then this one is funny. So I was trying to dig into some of the House Bill 3 provisions to see how these laws change things. And I found a TEA video. And so I apologize, this is a photo. But I thought it was interesting. So this was when House Bill 3 first passed in 2019. Reliance on recapture as structured was unsustainable. And at that point, they were projecting in 22 that without House Bill 3, recapture was going to hit 4.8 billion. Well, guess what? With House Bill 3, we hit that. So I thought that was interesting that back in 2019, TEA had this slide, and House Bill 3 was supposed to fix this, and it didn't. Still have no transparency where how recapture is being divvied out back to these school districts, right? Right. You don't know where they're where it's going. It's just going to their general fund, and they can do it. Not even going to states. Just not even right. going anywhere. Fund. Right. It's like the 8.2 billion they have saved from what they allocated to education is going somewhere else. All right. So other bills. So we've all heard about education savings accounts. Um, so each student or family that would receive $8,000 to go to private school. Um, so a school district, so Dripping Springs, because we have less than 20,000 students, the state would give us $10,000 for the first two years. I'm assuming that's $10,000 each year for the first two years. So it's interesting to me that they'll give a family $8,000 and the school ten. So they're willing to invest $18,000 and one kid to go to private school, but they're only giving me $6,000 per kid now. Um, to be eligible, and this is funny, to be eligible, you have to be in public school first. Or be enrolling in kindergarten or pre-K for the first time, so. For the 8,000, is it, do you have to, I'm sorry, you go back to that, do you have, it's rather or not your homeowner paying property taxes. So it's not a tax amendment, it's cash for you do your income taxes. So it's an additional filing on your income taxes, essentially. I don't know how it affects your income taxes. So I would assume the state would just give this directly to the private school. For two That they would have an enrollment portal and they would know Johnny's going to St. Michael's, and we're paying St. Michael's eight thousand dollars. It wouldn't be connected to income tax because that's. That. Well, that's what I was wondering. I just I, this is the biggest question yeah. I hear out there is how do you get it right? Is it a discount on your property tax bill? No. Or are you filing it? No. As it's the state tax saying tax I have all this money, so if you want to go to this private school, we'll just pay down. I heard an interesting comment yesterday. Private school told a parent, we're just going to jack up our tuition by $8,000. Of course they are. Of they are. So if you're already paying 10, now you pay 18, the state pays 8, mm -hmm. and you continue to pay 10. Uh, for the second bullet, they would pay the district money for that student to leave yes. and go to private school. This is to get the rural districts on board. Okay, that's what's the okay. smaller. And then do you think maybe some of that 10000 is for proportionate shares for like related services for speech therapy, occupational therapy, that they pay out? I haven't seen any details on what we okay. do with that 10000 okay. So it could be that. Okay. But it's just for two years. It's just for two years. Okay. Other bills, and this comes up every session, there's a big push to require that bond elections only happen in November. Okay, fine, but that delays progress, and then all school districts are looking for contractors and architects at the same time, so could drive up costs, and then our board elections are in May, so we wouldn't have the benefit of running those on the same election day, so we would have two um, election costs. And so what's going on this week? So yesterday, the House Youth Health and Safety met. Um, today, the House Public Education is meeting, considering Bill, House Bill 1 and House Bill 100, both related to teacher vacancies. Um, Senate Ed meets tomorrow. The 
The state budget will be considered on the House floor Thursday. So this is a busy, busy, busy week. Um, and with 400 amendments to some of these bills, no telling what will come out. So is this the first time I've finished my time? <laughs>